Signore e signori, buonasera. Benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerini Marimò della New York University, anche a nome del Centro Primo Levi qua a New York. As you know, every year for the past 20 years we were uh, discussing upstairs, uh, we have organized uh, events related to the Day of Memory. The International Day of Memory was instituted uh, in the European Union and in particular in Italy it was received by a specific law that mandates the celebration and the commemoration of the Holocaust with different events in schools, public places, and, and so on and so forth. And about 20 years ago, we decided to undertake this adventure here in New York. And I have to say that the real pioneers were the, our friends at the Centro Primo Levi. And there was not much the organizational effort that was also there, but the work of intelligence and fantasy, allow me to use this word, um, because it's very difficult every year to go back to these issues without repeating yourself, without giving the impression that you're telling a story that has already been heard. And in these 20 years, I think we have digged and explored all the different possible, not all of them, but many of many. them. And this year in particular, it's artists and the reaction and their reception uh, of the Holocaust and the experience that came with it. And Natalia is going to tell us something more about it. As you know, the day was established to commemorate the liberation of Auschwitz the extermination camp by the uh, Red Army. And it was chosen as the day specific of, of the liberation of Auschwitz. Um, there are many issues regarding memory. That's also one of the uh, things that we discussed in the past. What does it mean to commemorate? What does it mean to remember? What are the tools that we have to bring these memories back and to make them part of our life today? Um, as Every year we have events in different locations in New York. I would say that the main one is the reading of the names, and that's going to take place at the Italian Consulate General here in New York on Park Avenue, and it's on January 29th uh, from 8.30 in the morning. Uh, the names of, of all the Italian Jews and Jews living in the Italian territories uh, are read out loud, and a name is given to people that were also deprived of their names. It's a very moving moment, and we have students from different schools, and I strongly invite you to participate in, in that moment that is not only a ceremony, it's really a form of giving names. And to me, that's very, very important. Natalia. I and then I'm going to come back to tell you one more thing. Uh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Thank you, Stefano, and thank you all for being here. Um, and perhaps after so many years, uh, a few words are necessary to uh, to say what, what we're doing, what are we doing when we remember. And I think we've, done, we've been doing many different things. And one is the ceremony. That is the moment in which we come together and we come together with, with um, our friends and families that have survived the experience of the camps and the deportation. And uh, we have here Stella Levy, who has been our moral compass for all these years. And uh, Andrea Fiano, whose uh, father has been also here, um, also a survivor of Auschwitz, who has been here on the stage um, to tell about this story. So that moment is when we, um, we think about what people went through, what how many doors opened or closed for all of those who were trying to escape the persecution of their own state. And, um, and it's a very personal and intimate moment. The other events, however, have been events um, marked by the attempt to understand, to decode, to learn from uh, the, 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 the scholars, the archives, the people who, who study. And we have to remember that for many years, this story, the, the full story, was, uh, was not spoken about, was not studied, because archives until the late 1980s were not available to scholars, and was a very slow and difficult process, and it entailed the, the hard work of so many people who sat on a chair for months, for years. We have Susan Zuccotti here, um, who has been among uh, the scholars, um, to uncover the step by step, what, how a society, a, a state was undone, was taken apart by very small, small moves through years that 
led to the marginalization of group of citizens and eventually to their annihilation. And today, um, I, I, I would say, as uh, we're brought um, to the, the, you know, here to the Italian Cultural Institute, to um, the CUNY, to, to the Italian, to the Italian Academy, uh, many scholars who have been engaged in this work, and we have tried to um, to unpack very small, you know, very, very the, the the process and uh, and the technicalities. Of, uh, of, of this history. Today, I would say we all know a lot. Um, society has um, remained with the collective image of this, this tragedy and this persecution. And what we do with this? Uh, things are being done with it. And um, not all of them were um, in our intention, in the intention of those who studied, on the intention of those who, um, who it's made this, this history public. What do we do with the memory of Auschwitz? We, we are not, I, I think that we should be very careful that it doesn't become a terms of comparison, a term of a, a, a standard of violence and uh, uh, destruction of human life that makes us blind to everything that is less than that. And uh, I think when I walk the streets of New York with Stella and she sees a homeless person and she sees a worker that may not exist tomorrow because will be run over by a car and doesn't exist in the legalities of this country. Um, and the many people were invisible in our society. That instinct of solidarity, that moment of personal connection, that ability of seeing a human being in, any, in every other person, is something that has to remain very strong and very alive. And this is one of the reasons why we commemorate. After we teach history, after we study history, we are not going to resolve the wars around the planet. We are not going to um, eliminate violence and conflict. But we have to be able to speak in the places where there is peace and there is well-being and there are the means to talk to one another and this we are losing and this is very this is a, the one uh, i think element that we are living through the violence of words in a place where we can afford peace and we can afford dialogue and the, the claim for this violence is that we are fighting for something else that happens far away, but on which we are very, we must be very clear, we have no impact. And so this year we have thought of uh, all of those artists and intellectuals and filmmakers and writers who are not famous, some more than, than, than others, who have found ways not to, um, we found ways to translate their experience, translate what they had seen into small acts of freedom, and which is the freedom of not instrumentalizing the suffering of others in the past or the present. And I, and I think all of the programs of this year are, are thought under this, um, under these ideas. And, uh, I hope more people will join us for, for the next and for the work that we are doing um, online and uh, that we're hoping to carry on in the future of the center. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Natalia. It was not easy to synthesize the sense that we give to this day but you did it, and you did it beautifully. Thank you. Uh, just one thing. 
you can have a complete list of all the events that were uh, organized in all the different institutions on our website, on the website of the Centro Primo Levi. So you have a detailed list of events and where they happen and who's going to be where. But I want to mention one in particular because it's, uh, for us it was a huge undertaking. And it's the, um, this concert that is going to take place uh, on... Quando? 30th. 30th. Not here. Not here. It's going to be at the Bruno Walter um, Auditorium at the pub, uh, New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. And it's a rendition of probably the most famous poet of the, poem of the Italian Renaissance, the one by Lorenzo de' Medici, Quanta bella giovinezza che si fugge tuttavia, how beautiful is youth that runs away, nevertheless. And the interesting thing is that that work of music, that composition, has never been performed in New York after the first time. And the first time it was performed in 1948, um, it was for a ballet choreographed by George Balanchine. So there is the words of Lorenzo de' Medici, George Balanchine, the choreography, and two Italian artists, a poet and the painter, contributed with the sets, the costumes, and with the music. So it's a unique event. And it's a unique opportunity to hear it performed live um, in New York again. And with all the connotations of going back to the Renaissance when it comes to trying to find again the reasons to live, to relive. Um, so don't miss that. It's, for us, it was a huge effort, but I think it's worth it that we give voice again to these artists uh, that tried as much as they could to regain a sense and a taste for living. Basta, all the events are listed in the website. Take a look and come. Uh, tonight is going to be dedicated uh, totally to these two ladies. Um, and we have Alessandro Cassin, who is the co-director of the Centro Primo Levi and director of publications, uh, that has curated an exhibit that just opened in Milan, a photographic exhibit, and a catalog, beautiful, that is also upstairs if you're interested, um, on these two sisters, two remarkable sisters. And Alessandro is going to tell us something about their story. And then we're going to see two films, one short and one longer, to understand a little bit what they're all about and why we are bringing them in for the Day of Memory. Alessandro Cassini. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you all for being here. Good evening. I would like to thank the British Film Institute and Eva Klamp and Koslovsky for allowing me to show these films. They were recently restored and they are quite unique. Um, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, the Mazzetti twins, Paola on your left and Lorenzo, the filmmaker, on your right. Um, I will try to be brief. Um, Mm. Lorenza Mazzetti and her twin sister Paola were remarkable artists, free and independent women whose lives were shaped by early tragedy but in the hands of the Nazis. Lorenza and Paola were born in Rome in 1927. Their mother died soon after their birth and uh, their father decided to entrust the young the babies to his sister, Nina Mazzetti, who was married with Robert Einstein, the first cousin of the physician Albert. This branch of the Einsteins had been living in Italy since 1901. The Einsteins had two daughters of their own. They lived in the countryside outside of Florence and informally adopted the twins. The Mazzettis were Valdigians, that is, they belonged to the tiny Italian Protestant denomination, while Robert was, according to the fascist legislation, a foreign Jew. So a mixed couple living outside of Florence. Uh, Robert had been an electrical engineer, but because of the racial laws, had retired to the countryside, where the family survived without major problems until August 1944. On August, 40, on August 4th, 1944, two days before the liberation of Florence with the British army only 12 miles away, a Nazi unit reached the villa looking for Robert, who at the time was hiding in the woods. 
They asked for everybody's documents. They isolated the wife and the two daughters, put them in the room allegedly for interrogations, and a few uh, hours later killed them in cold blood. The twins survived possibly because they had a different last name and were assumed not to be Jewish. So this is the historical uh, fact in, in, in brief. Uh, Robert Einstein uh, arrived, uh, uh, the, 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 the Nazis got drunk, destroyed the villa, set it on fire and left. Robert returned, found uh, the family slaughtered uh, and uh, killed himself a year later after having provided for the twins, bringing them to Florence. So, um, you know, um, like, like most of these uh, terrific episodes, there was no thorough investigation at the time. So many, many questions, historical questions, remain unsolved. And 80 years after the fact, it's extremely difficult to reconstruct exactly what happened. To me, what makes the, this tragic story particularly compelling is the rare convergence of several parallel narratives that are usually studied separately. Foreign Jews in Italy, the Valdesians, the partisans, the Tuscan peasant world, the church, and of course, anti-Jewish persecution. Um, in the 1950s, Paola and Lorenza left Tuscany and moved to Rome. They shared an interest in paintings and psycho their shared interest in painting and psychoanalysis led them to live free and creative lives. I met them in Rome in the early 80s. Like everyone who had known them, I was struck by their multidirectional vitality, joyful, inflexible nonconformity. They survived their loss in their own way, through art making. Yet their testimony, rather than a story, has always been real life, direct communication, and artistic transposition. In a sense, they resisted the post-war canonization of the role of a witness and of a victim. As young, girls, they, um, as young girls and throughout their lives, until months before they died, they died respectively in 2020 and 2022, they were truly remarkable beings, and I will try to explain a little bit how. Today I'm here to talk about Lorenza. But allow me one anecdote about Paola. Paola became a painter and a psychoanalyst. Now, many of you know our beloved Stella Levy, who's sitting right here. Stella was in Rome. <clears throat> Having survived the deportation, Stella was in Rome in 1946. And through a network of friends, she met Paola, who became her analyst for a few months before Stella's departure for the US. Upon parting, Paola told Stella, you're a woman of great wisdom. You must become a rabbi, a rabbinessa. <laughs> At a time when women couldn't become rabbis, Paola was thinking outside the box. Now, a few words about how this roundabout and adventuresome way in which Lorenza uh, went to London and became a filmmaker. So in the early 50s, uh, England had a severe shortage of agricultural workers as a consequence of the many men who had died in the war. So the UK government started a program by which uh, uh, several Italian university would provide students who would go and work on farms and receive a small stipend and uh, academic credit for six months or a year. Lorenza volunteered. Once in England, she was assigned to a farm where she proved utterly unfit for the hard work in the fields. <laughs> not only was she physically weak, but at night she could not sleep because of a uh, uh, recurrent nightmares of what she had witnessed as a girl. After a few weeks, the farmer gave up on her and chased her away. So, again, in this, uh, she found herself with very little money, nowhere to go, didn't know what to do, and she made her way 
to London. She had several uh, odd jobs. She worked as an au pair. She had some uh, uh, romantic adventures. She was repeatedly robbed, harassed, uh, protected by the police, a variety of things, until one day, with enormous stamina and determination, she decided to, she walked into the Slade School of Fine Arts, the, the best art academy of the University of London. And uh, she went in and she started saying that she wanted to meet the director and she wanted to be a student there. And of course, the, the, the secretary tried to stop her and explain that, you know, admissions were not uh, accepted in the middle of the year. She could apply for the following year. There was no way she could talk to the, doc to the director nor be admitted. But Lorenza, in her characteristic stubbornness, just stood there and raised her voice saying, I want to speak with the director. I want to speak with the director now. Eventually, a man came out. She assumed he was the janit janitor and told him, told her to follow him. She brought him into his office and uh, she showed some drawings. He was not impressed and uh, asked, but why do you want to talk to the director and why do you want to study here? And Lorenza looked at him and said, because I'm a genius. <laughs> <coughs> now the director was a very smart man, uh, Walter Coldstream was his name, uh, was impressed by this uh, boldness of this woman and said, okay, I'm the director and you will be a student from tomorrow. <laughs> so she starts studying uh, painting and sculpting. She had amazing teachers among many, Lucien Freud, John Berger, etc. She enjoyed it until one day she discovered that the school had a film club and some film courses. So thinking that film was the art uh, form of the future, she decided to concentrate on that. So she followed these courses and then, then as now, uh, at the end to graduate, you had to produce a short. And she had no family who could um, support this, pay for the film. So she uh, really created the film in her head. She adapted uh, Kafka's Metamorphosis. She found the location. She found the actors among students. And when she realized that there was no way that she could really shoot the film, nor uh, graduate without it, she convinced two fellow students to break into the school at night and borrow camera, tripod, film stock, um, audio equipment. And she shot the film in a week. Then she brought the, the film to be developed and she forged the signature telling the lab that the school would pay for it. Now, of course, the security cameras of the, of the school caught her and again, the director had to intervene. So she was brought into the office and told, you know, I have to call the police. This is totally unacceptable. Theft is a crime. You forged the signature. This is not going to happen. But Lorenza kept on defending her film and explaining why she made it and how great it was. So the director again uh, decided, okay, this is what we'll do. We will have a screening of a film. I will invite all the faculty. I will invite the director of the British Film Institute, who's a friend, and the students. If a film has true artistic merits, you will graduate. If it doesn't, you will go to jail. <laughs> so they had the screening. The screening was an enormous success to the point that the director of the British Film Institute immediately told her he was going to finance her next film, which he did. He actually financed the next two. And, uh, and so this is how her uh, film career was launched with a theft. So, um, um, I would like to show you uh, a short film that she made the following year, 1954. It's another adaptation from Kafka, famous story, A Country Doctor. It's an 11 minute film and perhaps we can talk a little bit afterwards. I, I will just say that uh, um, Lorenza at this point of her life in England, had never spoken to anyone about what happened to her family. 
um, nor about her inner chaos and brokenness. Uh, instead, she used film to address some of her turmoil. Um, I, 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 I will discuss a little bit of the film after we see it, but I think it's better to see it with no words. Thank you. Okay, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with a story, but if you're not, what's not so clear in this, uh, the, the beginning of the story is a country doctor gets called in the middle of the night. He can't find his horse. His ho horse is too weak to carry him. And the strange appearance of a young man um, provides miraculously, uh, in the story, two horses here, one white horse. And the, 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 the bargain that's implicit is that he gives him the horse to go and do his duty, but he's going to take advantage of his young assistant, Rose. And so he leaves with this, uh, with this feeling of uh, having made a terrible bargain. In, in, my, in my reading of this film, there are a couple of different uh, moments that have great resonance with uh, Lorenzo's own story. The first is exactly this dilemma. Uh, should he go and uh, tend to the patient, or should he stay there to defend the young girl? And uh, having uh, this ghastly dilemma in accepting the horse, he, he, he kind of give, gives in to the predatory groom who, who provided him the horse. And I think that this echoes the choice that Lorenza assumed that Robert Einstein's um, um, wife and uh, daughters uh, had to do with the Nazis. So basically, the, the, the assumption is that the, the Nazis knew that uh, um, the three women knew where he was hiding and asked them to take him there. And they didn't, and they got killed. And so I think that in that particular, in, in this story, he, she saw this element. But the main point that I want to make regards the doctor's relationship with a young patient. So initially, he arrives on his, uh, at his house where everybody's tending the young boy. And he immediately assessed that the young boy, there's nothing wrong with him. He's pretending. And then in this ex ex extraordinary, uh, strange, nightmarish thing, Kafka has the doctor get in the bed with the patient. And only once he's in the, in the bed with a young boy, he realizes that indeed he has it, uh, a wound, a different kind of wound. A wound that in the story is described as big as the palm of the hand. And I think that what he's alluding to is uh, a kind of uh, existential, existential malady, uh, a disease of the soul, a depression. And uh, the doctor immediately realized this. And I think that Lorenza felt that uh, this uncurable, unconsolable um, malady is exactly what uh, she was experienced and her inability to talk about what had happened to her. And I think that this is really how uh, this particular film came about. I think it also has a very clear echo of um, Greek tragedy, Sophocles, Philoctetes. It's the same kind of thing. This hero was on his way to Troy and he gets a wound on his feet, foot. His foot gets, in different versions, either bitten by a snake or um, uh, a different kind of wound. In any case, the Greeks around him realize that this particular wound does not heal and possibly is contagious, and they're terrified. They're terrified by this wound, and they abandon him in the island of Lemno. So he never reaches Troy, and he's there in total solitude in this um, in this uh, island. It's particularly, um, it's, it's particularly interesting to think that the, tr the three uh, Greek tra uh, tragic authors, Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles, all wrote about this particular person. We, don't ha we only have Sophocles' version, but it was a very, very uh, big and early uh, description of some kind of uh, malady 
which I think is in common with this film and is exactly what um, Lorenza was describing um, as a result of her trauma. So now we'll see a different film. It's called Together. It's from 1956. This is her most famous film. It won an award at Cannes that year. It is about two death uh, dock workers in the East End of London, an area that had been heavily bombed by the Nazis during the war. Lorenza goes to this bombed out area and sees this, both the devastation, which I think again echoes her own inner devastation, but she also sees um, a bunch of street children living among the rubble. And, uh, and so I think uh, that she chooses this as the location because in the destruction, in the devastation, she also sees the wide open space of the imagination. So please, Julian, the film. I, I would like to say just a few words and then I'll open up for questions if you have any. Um, you know, this, this film... Um, um, it's, it was made, it was, uh, the person who edited was a, uh, Lindsay Anderson, who was the founder of this avant-garde movement of documentaries called uh, British Film uh, Free Cinema. Lorenza was the only member of this movement, and her films are this kind of strange and very interesting to me mixture of documentary and fiction. Uh, she worked with the two actors who were both art students. The taller one um, was a very fa became a very famous um, painter. The second one, Eduardo Paolozzi, despite his name, was a sculptor, a, a Scottish sculpt sculptor, and one of the pioneers of the pop art movement. I find it very interesting that she picked these two. Um, young man, gave them, explained to them what she wanted, and then as a director gave them close to no direction, trusting in their ability to improvise. The children and the dock workers and the scenes in the uh, pub are all from life. She did not stage anything. She just walked into a camera and filmed the occurrences as they happened. Uh, I know it's very late, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of um, what this um, free cinema movement was about. I will read a few key lines uh, from the manifesto that they wrote in 1956. Um, Our films have an attitude in common. Implicit in the attitude is a belief in freedom, the importance of people, and the significance of the everyday. As filmmakers, we believe that no film can be too personal. Images speak. Sounds amplify and comment. Size is irrelevant. Perfection is not an aim. An attitude means a style. A style means an attitude. So, um, you know, if, if people have comments, if you, if you have comments on the films or on any aspect of the story, I'd like, I'd be very happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you. What? Wait for you there? Okay. Yes. No, it's when I thought about the weakness of this. Uh, uh, film documentary. I cannot but think also about the same period in which. Uh, no, thinking about the bleakness of the images and especially the ending, I cannot but make a, some kind of reference to Night and Fog mm -hmm. that came out. Is that the same year? Or the year after? I don't remember exactly when, but there is some kind of reference to. I know to cruelty, to disappearance, uh, yes. to uh, gratuity. Absolutely, visually as well. Uh, also visually, right? It's yes. Extremely powerful. Thanks for showing it. Uh, yeah, you know, also perhaps uh, I want to say something about the title, Together, and uh, this idea of this private language is a made-up 
sign language between the two, and I think it relates directly to this private language between twins. And, uh, you know, as you saw in the movie, whenever the, it's the perspective of a two deaf uh, young men, you don't hear anything. When it's the children or the rest, there's sound around, but it's sound that they don't participate in. Paula, you have a question? Yes, please in the back. Um, I actually have two questions. Uh, yes. First is, whatever happened to the film that she had made for the director when she was in the school? Yes. Um, does that exist? Yes. Does it, it exist? It, it, Can it, we see it? Yes, it exists. It's called K. Uh, and uh, uh, it could be purchased from the British Film Institute, probably on Amazon as well. It was just shown on uh, January 19th at MoMA. Uh, MoMA showed the th four films that survived. It's interesting that she made these films. She had a lot of success with this one in particular. And then uh, for a number of reasons, but mainly because she wanted to be with her, her twin sister, she returned to Rome where she had more uh, and uh, different activities, but she never made movies again. Was going to be the second part of my question, so thank you. And then also the gentleman that she, with whom she worked, Dennis Horn. Yes. Did she work with him throughout all of her filming and her entire life, or was no, this just a not at all? I mean, uh, he 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 appears in the credits, but he did very little in the movie. They had a romantic uh, engagement. He was much more experienced. He wrote the script partly, but she rewrote it completely. So the script for this movie has really nothing to do with his script. It's her work. And, uh, and the relationship ended after this movie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Alessandro. Thank you. Um, the photography is stunning. It's very powerful. It's beautiful. And there are some moments that are reminiscent of some of the most uh, famous scenes of neorealism. So Absolutely. I was wondering, what was her relationship? Because she basically left Italy when neorealism was developing. Uh, she, so was she familiar? She, she didn't really see Italian neorealism -real until she returned to Italy in the 60s. And so this is uh, really her making. Actually, this movie, along with the other movies of this uh, movement, Free Cinema, really led into the British new wave of a new... Uh, of a, early 60s, all of those directors except her went on to be active participants in the British New Wave and they were also instrumental in bringing to England French avant-garde movies as well as Italian neorealism. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here.